Project Condor, a program aimed at developing an amateur rocket capable of performing controlled post-apogee cruises, was started in late 2011. The goal wasn't just to make one of those separating boost gliders or a plane with a rocket motor, but rather an actual rocket. This project would have to unfold in careful steps, having the prototype aircraft going through iterations and revisions along the way. First thing was, well, the design. It started off a plan drawn up very quickly in Roxim using 3-inch airframe. After that, construction of a mock-up quickly ensued. This mock-up demonstrated that 3-inch airframe was way too tight to work in any complex payload properly, so everything was redrawn with a 4-inch airframe in mind. The wing shape, the size of the belly strakes, and the rudder were all determined in the screwed plan. Most of the undetermined elements would need to be established during the actual construction of the aircraft. Now second, and oddly enough, before the rocket began construction, in spring 2012, the ground control station was developed and put together. This was done early in order to understand the full end-to-end -end scope of the project, which would eventually borderline the UAV territory. Next, the aircraft entered rocket flight testing and development. X-11 Mark B was built shortly after losing X-11 Mark A in a stupid incident. Having no electronic deployment, X-11 Mark A relied on motor ejection and the delay wasn't even adjusted for its flight. Needless to say, Mark A hurtled towards the ground with no parachute after showing, oddly, a perfect flight. It crashed and was not recoverable. X-11 Mark B was built almost the same but with an electronic deployment system to eliminate reliance on motor ejection. Both the iterations of the aircraft had no remote control ability and no remote video, flown just like traditional rockets. The goal of both these aircraft was to demonstrate that the aircraft's profile is stable as an uncontrolled rocket and that the aft deployment mechanism is reliable. X-11 Mark B finished off that phase of the project nicely. The following step ventured into controlled flight testing. In fall of 2012, X-11 Mark B was upgraded to Mark C with the already planned 1.25 inch by 8 inch elevons tied with steel push rods and quick lick attachments to S3004 Futaba servos. The rudder was also hinged and given a servo with a push rod. A six channel spectrum receiver was installed and configured. This iteration was flown twice and despite a few slight issues with pitch at launch, proved to be somewhat of a reliable flyer, provided the pilot knows what he's doing. Of course, the glides were incredibly short as precautions were taken. The altimeter was set to automatically fire the parachute only three seconds after the highest point in flight. Now everything would come together and go into UAV flight testing, but not without hardship. X-11 Mark D would see upgrades in spring 2013 including the wireless video, power system upgrade, on-screen telemetry, and a GPS receiver. Sadly, at a very first flight, the parachute tangled after deployment. The aircraft crashed, although just softly enough to spare all the electronics but the battery. The wing was repaired and reinstalled onto a new airframe, creating X-11 Mark E. Mark E would almost be at the completion point, but the glides would still be limited by post-apogee delay-based parachute ejection, still managed by the altimeter. The manual parachute system would need to wait for a future revision of the aircraft. X-11 Mark E lived the longest in the program so far. 10 flights straight from July to October 2013. The problem though was over half of those flights were repeated attempts at achieving just one objective. Record the video coming into the wireless receiver while flying the aircraft line of sight in case the FPV video is unreliable being at this point unproven. After one lost transmitter, and after discovering one faulty antenna extension, the aircraft's video system finally checked out, clearing the way for a true FPV flight with UAV-style controls using the control station that had been readied since March 2012. Now, in theory, X-11E would have been the fifth and last iteration in a program that planned for three phases of aircraft development. These phases were plane rocket, controlled rocket, and finally full-blown UAV rocket. 
However, due to the cost of certain parts involved, the final iteration would show up at the pad only in Spring 2014. X11, the final Mark, an upgraded Mark E rocket, would come with the required finishing touches, including manual parachute ejection control, aerodynamics improvements, and larger control surfaces, notably larger elevons. The altimeter would keep an important role on it, serving as an emergency deployment system, automatically firing the parachute at an altitude of 250 feet, eliminating the chances of the aircraft being flown too low. The final mark would test everything from end to end, rocket flight, post-apogee glide, manual parachute, video range, and increasing motor size. Now on a side note, in 2013 a new aircraft was developed into the program. X-10, a smaller, lighter, and low-power capable version of X-11. X-10 was used to achieve a few side objectives, such as electronic layout improvements, the drag reduction skirt concept, and the manual parachute ejection mechanism. The aircraft flew well over a dozen times, and while being badly damaged at the end of the 2013 season, did well in helping to research new features and adjustments. X-10 was easily repaired for a return to flight in the 2014 season. And this is where the program got to just last weekend. X-11 Mark Final took to its first flight on a Skidmark H180, still in the 29mm range, and performed incredibly. The pilot was able to execute full control, deploy the parachute manually, and touch down safely on an area previously selected during the glide flight. This is the flight that essentially achieved all of the objectives of the program once and for all. Condor X-10 also demonstrated the concept to be easy to operate, safe, and working very much as expected, flying the day after its big sister using an H-135W motor, holding a 10-second glide until finally the altimeter aborted flight. Of course, all good things must come to an end. Okay, well, not really, but this time they sure did, and quick. X-11's next mission, an extended objective, was to prove its ability to fly 54mm motors. Planning had been carefully made for this flight. The aircraft rebalanced for proper weight distribution during its upgrades. However, the one fear that remained, the fear of having a structural failure, became an ugly truth only 1.2 seconds into her first flight on a 54mm motor. At an altitude of about 500 feet in the flight, the aircraft lost one elevon and had the remaining one severely damaged. In addition to the lost elevon, some of the wing surface around it had gone missing as well. Noticing the control loss, I tried to keep the rocket in a knife using the rudder, but it kept snap rolling out of it because the one remaining damaged elevon was now flailing around freely. The parachute was deployed as the aircraft had reached an unwanted speed of about 130 miles an hour. The deployment occurred safely, and aside from the structural failure, no other damage was sustained, leaving a full set of working electronics and many workable airframe portions. Now X-10 experienced its own failure on the following day, on its second flight. Coming right off the launch ramp, it appears that the two 12 volt power leads feeding the video on the remote control systems came loose. Needless to say, I went from pilot to observer of a ballistic return very quickly on that flight. Yes, the altimeter did fire the ejection match at 250 feet, but the aircraft was descending so fast, too fast for the pressure build up to fire out the parachute before the impact with the ground. The crash was really hard, the hardest one of any of my rockets so far since I've rejoined the hobby in 2010. About half the electronics were lost along with the entire airframe. The impact went as far as killing two of the aircraft's three servos without directly touching them. Now what do these two failures mean for the program? Does it spell the end? Well, not really. This is the bright spot in the dark passage. Condor Griffin, the successor to the X-11 prototype, has been in planning since November 2013. This non-prototype version of the aircraft will be meant for repeated all-around use as a UAV rocket and should share little to none of the issues observed on X-11 and X-10 over the past two years of flying. 
one of the most important pieces of information for the construction of Griffin didn't happen with marks A through E on X11. It happened last weekend with the final mark. The structural damage on a wing and control surfaces actually doubles as a map for wing reinforcement. While I'd already drawn up several ways of improving the wing's sturdiness for Griffin, I had no guide on where the wing would experience the harshest of stress and thus require the most amount of reinforcement until now. X10, on the other hand, gave me another clear sign of its own. The power lead connections, the bridges, between both the front bay and the airframe bay need to be far more reliable, and thus this calls for a change of connector type. 4-pin connectors as seen on PC video cards may finally be used to ensure maximum reliability and the absolute lowest possibility of a disconnection in flight. It should be about 2-3 to three weeks before construction begins. Griffin will be quite similar to X11, but entirely different in its own respect. Meant to primarily fly 54mm motors, it shall be tougher, more robust, and have a far more reliable electronic layout. Its development and construction should last about two months, and the bottom line should be an aircraft that will first spread its wings on a full-fledged Condor aircraft configuration, equipped with a whole set of UAV gear starting Flight 1. I'm even developing a virtual reality control application that uses the Oculus Rift. And while that project is pending regulation review, there's good odds it becomes a safe and reliable primary option for flying the rocket. Until then, I hope you can all savor the great progress that's been done so far and all the videos and imagery related to it. While rarely ever going over budget and only experiencing a handful of failures through the years, the program has yielded an aircraft model that can be reliably constructed and flown with unique features that we just simply don't see often enough in rocketry. Griffin's plans and construction documentation is being developed alongside the aircraft and yes, upon completion, this content should be made available to the public, possibly in the form of a documentation kit available at a decent price. Beyond that point, I'll be opening the possibility for others to enjoy the capabilities of this bird, the fun you can have during its construction, and the incredibly steep but tantalizing learning curve involved in building this machine from end to end. If I do all of this right, in the end, what I hope to see is a good number of rocketry enthusiasts flying a machine that they'll not only never see drift into distant unknown on an unguided parachute descent, but that they'll also be able to control. Yes, this is definitely not the first rocket capable of a glide in the hobby, but so far it certainly is the one with the best balance between power and reliability, it's the easiest one to build, and certainly it's probably one of the coolest looking ones if that's what you're looking for. What about after the Griffin? Are there any other plans? Oh yeah, there's plans. Yeah, yeah they're, they're completely and ambitiously insane. However, I'm only going to describe these when I finally get to them. First, we have an aircraft to build. Let's go get ourselves a Griffin.